poems at the end of the novel, purportedly written by a fictitious group of academics from Argamasilla, are ludicrous. Nevertheless, they also provide a good summary of the issues we have contemplated throughout part one. The name of the first poet, Monikongo, refers to the kingdom of the Congo and reminds us of the story of Princess Mikomikona and his burlesque mistake of comparing Don Quixote to Jason of Crete reiterates the theme of the labyrinth. In the second sonnet, when it's said that inspired by Dulcinea, queen of El Toboso, Don Quixote tread on either side of the great Sierra Negra and the famed Campo de Montiel, the geographic hyperbole emphasizes the racial metaphor of the Sierra Morena that separates Castilla de la Mancha from Africa. In the third sonnet, war, which is represented by the mythological gods Mars and Bellona, contrasts with Cervantes' art of redefining the caballero as a captive of love instead of a violent madman. Our Manchegan triumphs thanks to new feats and the fact that art has invented a new style for this newest paladin. The sonnet dedicated to Sancho refers to his ass as a moral symbol describing the squire's troubles as a strange miracle. It states that he could have been made a count had there not been conjured to his great harm those insolences and insults that swarm this world, not even sparing a donkey. Later, when it says of the donkey that mounted on him he walked, pardon the lie, this gentlest of squires, we hear a double irony because Sancho was not altogether gentle, nor was he always mounted on his ass. Finally, the first poem called Epitaph underlines our hero's status as well thrashed, bien molido, and the second epitaph hints at Dulcinea's mixed ethnicity. She was of pure stock, as well as the likelihood that she was a prostitute, and she had the inklings of a lady. Given this last insult, which draws on the novel's multiple male obsessions, those of Don Quixote himself, Cardenio, the first Anselmo, and above all, Eugenio. Cervantes' final citation of Ariosto, perhaps another will sing with a more graceful style, reads like a final nod in favor of the Italian author's decision to have Reinaldo of Montalban refuse to test the sexual purity of women. Let's review. As Cervantes would say, the final, final denouement of the 1605 novel consists of three stories that focus on miscegenation or racial mixing. First, the adventure of the Knight of the Lake is a catabasis, a descent through the blackness of the lake that ends with a quasi Quranic fantasy involving a veritable fleet of maidens. It's an allegory of the Oedipal state in which so many men live. It indicates that one solution to this problem is courtly or Petrarchan love, that is, mature devotion to a single woman, although with the major corollary that it's important not to obsess over her racial or sexual purity. Second, after the arrival of the symbolic spotted she-goat, Eugenio tells the story of Leandra and Vicente, which ends with the sharp contrast between Anselmo's acceptance of women's imperfections and Eugenio's decision to cling to childish intolerance. Don Quixote comes to the defense of Leandra. The violent struggle between our Hidalgo and the goat herd suggests that we are all brothers in hell. Third, we have the final adventure that leaves us with one of the novel's most enigmatic images. What are we to make of the confrontation between Don Quixote and the penitents carrying the image of the spotless or immaculate virgin? In his failed attempt to rescue a statue of St. Mary, draped in mourning, Cervantes represents his hero as if he were both Eugenio and Captain Biedma trying to rescue Leandra and Zoraida. So Don Quixote returns to his village in a cage. Sancho and his wife have a suggestive conversation about asses and money. And the narrator tells of the discovery of a lead box containing dedicatory poems. This climactic textual windmill seems to be a commentary on the looming historical tragedy of the expulsion of the Moriscos. 
The crashing sound, the bell, the fight followed by the pathetic sound of the penitent's trumpet, all of these move us from the problem, ethnic violence, toward the solution, acceptance that the Moriscos are Christians. The same idea can be seen in the black and white colors that contrast and blend in the boiling lake of tar, the spotted she-goat, the cloaked statue of the Virgin, and of course, Sancho's gray ass, all indications of the Spanish labyrinth as a middle shade or hue between Europe and Africa. At the end of Don Quixote, obsessions with racial, cultural, or religious purity are logically and materially unsustainable, but they also seem tragically inevitable.